Hey, crime connoisseurs. If you're like me, you love diving into a good book. I especially love finding a book about cases we cover. But sometimes it's hard to find the time to sit and read. We live in an on-the-go society. Thankfully, Audible makes it easy to instantly access the books we love without sacrificing our time. With over 180,000 audiobooks and more, you will undoubtedly find one that will grip you and leave you not wanting to pull away while still being able to do other things. You can get a free 30-day trial membership by going to audibletrial.com backslash ccpod to start listening to your favorite books. That's audibletrial.com backslash ccpod for your free 30-day trial membership. Welcome back, all my fellow crime connoisseurs. I'm your host, Grace D. And to start off, I just want to say I apologize for the delay in getting this episode out to you guys. I recently started a new position at my company, and I've been really taking time to concentrate on the duties and the responsibilities of it while trying to give you the best content for this episode as possible. Because when I say that I went down the rabbit hole on this case, I was Alice chasing the white rabbit falling down and down and down the hole. It was something that one thing after the next, I just couldn't believe and it had me completely dumbfounded. And I wrote the script out and it was almost an hour and a half long. So this episode is going to be broken into two parts because the information is just so important to be able to tell you guys. Today's case is brought to you by a case suggestion from someone that I received a message on from Instagram. Her name is Monique, and her boyfriend told her about a girl from the neighborhood where he grew up in Hanford, California. An 11-year-old girl goes missing without a trace, only for tragedy to strike a family even more. This is the case of Tracy Renee Conrad. On February 25th, 1996, 11-year-old Tracy Renee Conrad, who was known as Renee, was having a typical Sunday. Renee spent that Sunday morning singing in the church choir, coming home, loading the dishwasher, and working on a book report. Renee made it about halfway through her book report when around like 1.15, 1.30 p.m., she went into the family living room where her dad was watching TV. She asked him if she could go play at a friend's house that was a block away. Chris Conrad said she could go, and like any parent in the middle of winter, he reminded her to put on her coat before going out. Chris never imagined that the last words he'd ever hear his daughter say would be, See ya, Dad. As it got later on in the day, and Renee still hadn't returned home by 5 p.m., her family started looking for her. Around 6.45 that evening, her family contacted the police department. They informed officers that they had allowed Renee to go to the Gallic residence to play with the boys who lived there. Bloodhounds were brought in to try and find Renee. They tracked her scent to the house where she was headed to play, but no one was home. The dogs continued to follow her scent to a park about a half mile away to a pond where she liked to catch frogs. Besides the friend's house and the park, the dogs tracked no other scents for Renee. It was as if she had just up and vanished. Police drained the pond, thinking maybe she ended up there by some freak accident. But like everything else in their search, nothing. Another dead end. That evening, officers went to the Gallic home and spoke with Marjorie May Gallic, the homeowner. She indicated that out-of-state relatives were also there staying with her. At around 7.30 p.m., her son Kevin, 
his two sons, and Kevin's girlfriend arrived to the Gallic residence. Officer Robert Dewey spoke briefly with Kevin and the others to see if they had seen Renee. Officer Dewey and Investigator Pete Mose returned to the Gallic house around 10.30 p.m. to talk to Kevin and his mother, Margie. During their visit, Officer Dewey made a preliminary search of the garage, family room, living room, kitchen, and one of the bedrooms. Nothing significant was found in the search. At this time, Officer Dewey did not search the house's backyard. Officer John Hoover also arrived at the Gallic residence around 10.30 p.m. Officer Hoover observed Kevin walking from a fenced-in portion of the west side of the house. He asked Kevin if he had been contacted by other police officers regarding Renee being missing. Kevin was sweating heavily, his pupils were dilated, and he appeared to be nervous and agitated. To Officer Hoover, it seemed like Kevin was under the influence of a controlled substance. Kevin gave Officer Hoover consent to search the Gallic residence and the backyard. Officer Hoover conducted a cursory search of the backyard. He noticed some pottery and ceramic molds and asked Kevin what they were for. Kevin explained their use, but didn't mention the kiln to the officer. Kevin lifted the cover of the hot tub for Officer Hoover's inspection. Officer Hoover assumed that the backyard had been previously searched and just gave it another quick look over. As Officer Hoover was leaving the Gallic residence, he noticed a trailer parked in the driveway with a padlock on the door. He asked Kevin if he could open the trailer to look inside. Kevin told him he didn't have the keys but would try to find them. While Kevin was looking for the keys, Officer Hoover continued contacting neighbors along the street. After speaking with a neighbor for approximately five minutes, Officer Hoover returned to the Gallic house and noticed an extension cord leading from the house to the trailer. At this point, Officer Hoover asked Kevin again for the keys. Kevin said he couldn't find them, and he thought that the keys might have been locked inside the trailer as he'd been in it earlier that day. He told Officer Hoover that he and his girlfriend sometimes slept in the trailer. Officer Hoover told him to keep looking for the keys, while he then left for about five minutes to contact another neighbor. When Officer Hoover returned, Kevin was moving pottery from the west side of the house into the back of a pickup truck parked in front of the home. Kevin told Officer Hoover that he thought he might have left the keys of the trailer in an antique shop that he was at earlier that day and would check there when he delivered the pottery. Now, at this point, Officer Hoover became suspicious and called Investigator Mose to come back to the Gallic house. By the time Officer Hoover had called Investigator Mose, Kevin had already left with his girlfriend. Officers followed Kevin and located him near an antique store, unloading pottery from the truck and into a nearby trailer. Kevin and his girlfriend went to the door of a residence where a man and a woman met them. The two entered the trailer and were out of sight. After approximately five minutes, Kevin and his girlfriend reappeared, exited the trailer, and got into their truck. The officers followed them back to the Gallic residence. Kevin was then again asked for the keys, and when he could not produce the keys for the trailer, the police officers decided to cut the lock off with bolt cutters. When investigator Bruce Blodgett arrived with the bolt cutters, Kevin asked, quote, Now we're only looking for the little girl, right? End quote. Investigator Blodgett cut off the lock and entered the trailer. Upon entering the trailer, he observed some glass pipes, a roach clip, and a mirror on the bed. The items were commonly used in the consumption of controlled substances. Investigator Blodgett moved the bedding over the items and told Kevin, quote, Let's just pretend we didn't see that. End quote. The officers found no evidence that Renee was in the trailer. It was around 12.30 a.m. when Officer Hoover finished canvassing the neighborhood and Officer Keith Pruitt contacted Kevin in front of the house. Kevin told Officer Pruitt he just remembered that at around dusk the previous day, he had observed a 1970s model passenger car with three male occupants drive slowly past his house approximately three times. He said the males appeared to be cruising the area. As time went by, trees and mailboxes donned yellow ribbons. 
Storefront windows were plastered with Renee's missing persons flyer. The police and the FBI had not uncovered any signs of an abduction or a crime. Investigators didn't believe that this was a case of a runaway child either. America's Most Wanted featured Renee's case in hopes of gaining insight into her disappearance. After weeks of searches, door-to-door, aerial, across fields, and underwater, Renee's disappearance remained an absolute mystery. On March 10, 1996, Renee's father, Chris Conrad, told the Los Angeles Times, quote, We still believe with all our hearts that Renee is alive and with somebody. I don't believe she is in that place of her free will. We will never, ever give up hope, nor will we stop looking for her, end quote. Eleven days later, on March 21st, Margie began smelling something from outside. Almost four weeks after Renee's disappearance, the smell became so strong she could no longer keep her windows open. Margie investigated the smell and noticed ceramic molds and pans piled on top of the kiln that had not been there for at least six months. She also saw flies. And around 6.30 that evening, Margie finally asked her other son, Michael Gallick, to go check the kiln. After checking in the kiln, Michael asked his mom what kind of jacket Renee was wearing. When they determined that Renee's body was probably in the kiln, Margie decided to call the police. But before she could do so, Kevin had called her. Margie told him what they had found and that they were going to be calling the police, and Kevin told her that he would be home in a little while. But Kevin never came home that evening. Police responded to the call at the Gallic home. A distinct, foul odor was coming from the area of the kiln. When the officers opened the kiln, they were met with a tragic sight. Renee's body was stuffed inside a three-foot-high by two-and-a-half-foot-wide kiln. She was wrapped in a pink and white striped sheet. After removing the sheet, police discovered a white t-shirt wrapped and tied around Renee's head. The t-shirt was a man's Fruit of the Loom brand, extra, extra large, size 5052. Two strips of cloth were tied around Renee's head, one around her eyes, and one around her neck. The strips of cloth were terry cloth toweling, and one of the strips had seashell patterns. At least three, possibly four, one-inch wide strips of duct tape were over Renee's mouth. Underneath the tape, was an athletic sock. Renee's wrists and ankles were bound with nylon pantyhose. Renee's father identified the clothing, jewelry, and glasses taken from the body as what Renee was wearing when he last saw her when she left the house. Now, I want to give a trigger warning. We're about to cover the area of sexual assault and it might be triggering and hard for some listeners to hear. Dr. Thomas Bennett, a forensic pathologist and an expert in the sexual abuse of children, reviewed photographs and reports of Renee's autopsy. Renee died of asphyxiation caused by the bindings and gag over her mouth. Renee's genitals had evidence of pre-death penetrating sexual injuries. Her external genitalia displayed bruising and scraping injuries consistent with a blunt force injury to the area. The opening of Renee's vagina contained fresh tears and abrasions consistent with penetrating sexual injuries. The injuries occurred before or around the time of Renee's death and were consistent with trauma suffered from sexual abuse. As detailed in the SART report, the right labia majora had a dark red pigment from the pubic mound area to the buttock. Halfway down on the right labia majora, there was an area of darker pigmentation, possibly suggesting a scratch, scrape, or abrasion. Two scratches, possibly from fingernails, were on the right labia majora near the vaginal opening. 
An apparent abrasion appeared on the left labia majora. Two apparent fingernail-like divots, described as moon-shaped lacerations, also appeared on the left labia majora. The SART nurse suggested law enforcement should take impressions of the suspect's fingernails both individually, finger by finger, and together of both hands. Dr. Laura Slaughter, an expert in sexual abuse of children, reviewed the colposcopic examination of Renee. For those who may not know, a colposcopy is a medical diagnostic procedure to visually examine the cervix as well as the vagina and the vulva using a colposcope. Dr. Slaughter suggested that there was evidence of blunt force penetrating trauma to Renee's genitalia. On March 22, 1996, police officer Tom Shiringa searched Kevin's residence. He discovered a pillowcase in the linen closet, which had the same pattern as the sheet wrapped around Renee's body. In the laundry room, Officer Sharinga discovered a towel with the same seashell pattern as the cloth found tied around Renee's eyes. Officers found several pairs of nylon pantyhose in the laundry room and the hallway outside of the laundry room. In the northwest corner bedroom of the house, Officer Sharinga noticed the wallpaper matched the color and the pattern of the sheet used to wrap Renee's body. One of the twin beds in the room contained a pair of women's white shorts and a pair of pantyhose. Four pieces of mail addressed to Kevin were found in the bedroom. Also found in the bedroom were two men's t-shirts, Fruit of the Loom brand, extra extra large, size 5052. The same ones that were over Renee's head. On March 27, 1996, police arrested Kevin Gallick Sr. at 5.10 p.m. on the charge of murdering a child. The arrest was based on physical evidence, witness statements, and forensic tests. Kevin was booked into the Kings County Jail. His brother Michael and other members of the Gallick family expressed disbelief at Kevin's arrest in Renee's case. They said, while Kevin had a drug problem, killing a child would be out of character. Michael said, quote, he would never do anything like that, end quote. Kevin Dwayne Gallick spent less than five minutes in municipal court as Judge Ronald J. Maciel ordered him held without bail on one count of murder and appointed Deputy Public Defender Marianne Brock to represent him. The arraignment was continued until May 17th. Kevin, dressed in a red jumpsuit, with his hands handcuffed in front, waived his rights to a speedy trial on the charge of murdering Tracy Renee Conrad and would face his day in court in 1997. Renee's parents, Chris and Tracy Conrad, sat in the first row of the spectator section behind the prosecutor. They conferred briefly with the deputy district attorney, Larry Crouch, before the arraignment began. Uncover the secrets of your dog's DNA with Wisdom Panel, the world's leading canine genetics test. With a simple cheek swab, Wisdom Panel can reveal your dog's breed, ancestry, health traits, and so much more. Understanding your dog's genetic background can help you provide the best care possible. Whether it's identifying potential health risks, understanding their behavior, or simply satisfying your curiosity about your dog's unique heritage, Wisdom Panel delivers the insights you need. Their state-of-the-art technology analyzes over 350 breeds, types, and varieties, and screens for over 200 genetic health conditions. Plus, their easy-to-understand reports make it simple to learn about your dog's genetics. Join the millions of pet parents discovering their dog's story with Wisdom Panel. Order your kit today and start exploring your dog's DNA. Because every dog has a tail, and Wisdom Panel helps you tell it. Go to wisdompanel.pxf.io backslash ccpod to learn more about your four-legged friend. 
That's wisdompanel.pxf.io backslash ccpod. Kevin's brother, Michael, sat in the front on the other side. Maciel issued a gag order barring officials from discussing the case with reporters to control the information the public received during the long delay. Preliminary autopsy reports were released and indicated that Renee had suffocated, although no signs of trauma were visible. The report did not say whether she was sexually assaulted or not. The timing of this case left some people questioning. You see, Young girls have been murdered in February or March for three straight years in this San Joaquin Valley farming region, and they were all suffocated. Ten-year-old Angelica Ramirez of Hanford vanished from the Vasali swap meet on March 3rd, 1994. An eight-year-old Maria Pacino of nearby Limore disappeared on March 27th, 1995, while running an errand for her mother. Now, Jean McCurdy, a petty officer first class at Lemoore Naval Air Station, was charged with murdering Maria. However, no one has been charged in Angelica's death. And some people thought, could this be connected? Kevin Gallick, who had been living on the property where Renee's body was found, was questioned shortly after the disappearance, police said. He is the son of the homeowner. Gallic, who stands six foot two and weighs 210 pounds, was questioned again and gave his statement before he was arrested. The chief would not say if he confessed, but he did say, quote, We do not believe any other member of the Gallic family is involved in this case. End quote. On March 29, 1996, investigator Mose returned to the Gallic residence. During an inspection of the area around the kiln, investigator Mose noticed a telephone wire running from the house to the trailer parked in the driveway. A portion of the wire was wrapped with one inch wide duct tape. This was the same whip tape used to gag Renee. Investigators collected a sample of the wire with duct tape. On February 25, 1996, Kevin initially told authorities that he had left home around 1.30 p.m. and went to Pep Boys with one of his sons to buy a muffler. Kevin and his son drove to several locations looking for someone to weld the muffler. Kevin came home briefly at approximately 5.15, 5.30 p.m. He then went to Fresno to pick up his girlfriend, and they got home around 7.30 p.m. See, at trial, one of Kevin's sons agreed that Pet Boys was about a five or ten minute drive from their house. Kevin initially testified that it was maybe a ten minute drive, but he didn't know for sure. He later agreed with his trial attorney's assessment that it was a five or ten minute drive. Kevin continued telling law enforcement a similar version of events three days later. He told investigator Bruce Blodgett, that he and his son had gone to Pep Boys in Hanford around 1 to 1.30 p.m. that day. Afterward, they went to Walmart in that Pep Boys shopping center. Kevin stated he and his son also went to Harris Auto Wrecking in Hanford and an antique store. Kevin said his son was with him the entire afternoon. Kevin told investigator Blodgett that he had the muffler he purchased on Sunday installed at a muffler shop on Tuesday. On March 22, 1996, the day after Renee's body was discovered, investigator Mose interviewed Kevin again. The interview lasted approximately three and a half hours, and it was recorded on both video and audio tape. Portions of the audio tape were played for the jury. During the interview, Kevin again claimed that he had left his residence in the early afternoon when Renee disappeared. This time, he claimed that he left with one of his sons to go to Pet Boys around 12 to 12.30 p.m. They stayed at Pet Boys for approximately 20 minutes, purchased the muffler. They then went to the nearby Walmart and stayed there for about 30 minutes looking for clamps for the muffler. Then they went to the junkyard and spoke with Marvin Harris in hopes of finding someone to weld the muffler on. 
They went with Harris to purchase some gas for Harris's vehicle. They returned to the junkyard and spoke for a few more minutes. After going to an antique store, Kevin claimed he returned home around 5 or 5.15. He couldn't remember exactly what he did in the house. He then left, got some propane for the vehicle, and went to Fresno to pick up his girlfriend. On the way back, he stopped and probably got some fast food. He returned home around 7.30 p.m. When he returned home, the police were there looking for Renee. He did not want police to search the trailer because he had drug paraphernalia in it. When initially interviewed by the police, Kevin could not produce a receipt for the muffler. At trial, Lester Langley, a district loss prevention manager with Pep Boys, testified regarding the inventory and sales paperwork used by Pep Boys. An item movement report from the Pep Boys store in Hanford in the Walmart shopping center showed a Crew Chief brand muffler, part number A9141, was purchased on February 25th, 1996, at 5.25 p.m. It was the only muffler bought that day. Langley identified an empty muffler box obtained from Kevin as the same one sold on February 25th, 1996. During his trial testimony, Kevin indicated he purchased the muffler at 5.25 p.m. on the day Renee disappeared. The trial evidence established that Kevin did not visit Marvin Harris at the junkyard on the day that Renee disappeared. Instead, he likely visited Harris on Tuesday, February 27, 1996, between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Kevin wanted Harris to weld on the muffler for him. It was raining that day. Neither Harris nor his girlfriend saw any children with Kevin or in his truck. Now, buckle up, buttercups, because we're going to go on a little adventure here. Rain fell in Hanford on February 27th and 29th, 1996, but it did not rain on the 25th, 26th, or 28th. On the day Kevin visited with him, Harris was preparing to take scrap to the recycler. Deliveries of scrap metal were made from the junkyard to the recycler on February 26th, 27th, and 28th, but not on February 25th. This tells us that the only possible day Kevin could have been at Harris's was on Tuesday, February 27th, 1996. Ken Conley testified that he saw Kevin at Harris's junkyard on Tuesday after Renee disappeared, February 27th. Kevin asked Conley if he could weld on a muffler to his car. That evening at approximately 10.30, 11 p.m., Conley went to the Gallic residence and welded on the muffler. Conley did not see any police around the house at that time and left at approximately 1.30 a.m. The prosecution established that Kevin was home at the times during the day Renee disappeared. Sometime that day, between noon and 12.30, Margie and her friend had left the residence. Kevin was in the garage at the time. And after Margie and her friend left, Kevin's younger son played video games in a bedroom with a friend. He also watched television in the living room. At some point, the boys went to a local school. When leaving, Kevin was in the trailer. A short time later, the boys returned home to play more video games. The son did not see Kevin when they returned. The son's friend left that afternoon when his father came to the Gallic residence. At that time, Kevin's younger son and his friend had been playing video games in a bedroom. The father rang the doorbell and the son answered the door. Margie and her friend returned to the Gallic residence at about 6.15 p.m. and the house was empty. Kevin's older son spent much of that day at the home of his friend. The older son came home between noon and 1 p.m. to eat and pick up clothes before returning to his friend's house. According to the son, nobody was home at that time, and he was home for about 30 minutes to an hour. The younger son testified that after his friend left, he continued playing video games for a while. He then watched television in the living room. According to the son, Kevin entered the residence and watched a movie with him in the living room. They watched a movie for about 60 to 90 minutes. 
During that time, Kevin's other son called twice and asked to borrow a bicycle. The other son spoke with Kevin and asked for a ride. Kevin said that he was watching a movie and he declined to leave to pick up his older son. According to Kevin's younger son, he and Kevin went to Pet Boys to purchase a muffler after the movie ended. They went to Walmart to look for clamps. They returned to the Gallic residence, and when they pulled up to the house, the son saw Renee's sister riding a bicycle away from the Gallic residence. The son yelled out at her, but she continued riding away. A short time later, the younger son and Kevin left to purchase propane at a local gas station. They returned home for a few minutes. The son waited in the vehicle while Kevin went inside to get something to drink. They left again and drove to Fresno to pick up Kevin's girlfriend. They got to get her at around 6.15 p.m. Now, the prosecution established that Kevin received telephone calls at the residence at 1.32 p.m., possibly at 1.55 p.m., and finally at 2.41 p.m. During a recorded conversation with police, Kevin's younger son said that on the day Renee disappeared, Kevin had instructed him to, quote, tell anyone that asks that they went to Walmart to buy clamps, end quote. At trial, the son testified that he went to Pet Boys with Kevin to buy the muffler and afterward they went to Walmart to purchase the clamps. The son could not remember ever telling officers that Kevin had told him to lie about going to Walmart, and the son denied making that statement. During trial, Kevin claimed he had instructed his son to lie about going to Walmart because he was late to pick up his girlfriend that afternoon. Kevin told the jury that he could no longer remember if he went to Walmart on the day in question or not. Kevin later testified he, quote, never asked anybody to lie for me except for my son that night. Does your furry friend deserve the best? Of course they do. That's why there's Box Dog, a seasonal box of premium products designed just for your pooch. With Box Dog, you can spoil your pet with a fun and exciting selection of high quality items. From gourmet treats and chew toys to comfy apparel and unique accessories, Box Dog has it all. Each box is packed with hand selected products guaranteed to wag tails and bring joy. But Box Dog isn't just about products, it's about providing a personalized experience for your pet. You can customize each box to suit your dog's specific needs and preferences, ensuring they get what they love every time. And the best part? BoxDog delivers straight to your door, making it a convenient and hassle-free way to keep your pet pampered. So why wait? Treat your dog to the luxury they deserve with BoxDog, because every dog deserves a box full of happiness. Order your BoxDog today. Go to boxdog.pxf.io backslash ccpod. That's boxdog.pxf.io backslash ccpod. End quote. He reiterated he asked his son to say something about Walmart if he was late picking up his girlfriend. Other evidence suggested that Kevin may have lied to his younger son about their shared sock drawer. It's important to note here that the son wore ankle socks, and that is not the sock that they was found that gagged Renee. The son shared a dresser with Kevin, and police believed that the sock used to gag Renee had come from that dresser. On the day Renee disappeared, the younger son had noticed that the sock drawer was open and messy. When the son asked Kevin about it, Kevin said that the FBI had searched the dresser. At trial, Kevin denied seeing Renee on the day of her disappearance. He denied killing her. His defense was that based on the contention of his half-brother, Michael Gallick was the one guilty of the crimes charged against him. The same brother who has stood by him and defended Kevin the entire time. Kevin was now pointing the finger at him. At trial, Michael testified that on the day Renee disappeared, 
He was in Fresno at his place of employment until about 3 p.m. He spent time with his girlfriend before going to her residence until about 9 p.m. Michael's friend confirmed his alibi for the jury. On cross-examination, Kevin testified that on the day of Renee's disappearance, he had returned home around 10.30 a.m. after taking his girlfriend to work in Fresno. He stated he was in the garage working on his mother's car most of the time, watched TV for a while, and did some drugs. He said he did crank or meth off and on all day. Kevin admitted he had told police he went to Pep Boys to buy a muffler in the early afternoon. He claimed he had repeated the same story to the police several times because he was worried about the drug paraphernalia in the trailer. Once the drugs were discovered and ignored by police, Kevin did not change his story because he was worried that if he did, he would get into trouble for lying to the officers. Kevin agreed with the prosecutor that he told a total and complete fabrication about going to the junkyard and speaking with Marvin Harris on the day of Renee's disappearance. Kevin testified that he had been afraid to change his story. He admitted he was probably home around 1.30 p.m. on the day that Renee disappeared. He testified he told police he had left to get the muffler around that time to keep them from becoming suspicious and going through the trailer. During closing arguments, the prosecutor contended that Kevin alone molested Renee and killed her. The totality of the record strongly points to Kevin's guilt. The trial evidence established that he had the opportunity to commit the crime. He was home on the day that Renee went to the residence. A reasonable belief overwhelmingly exists that the items used to bind and wrap Renee came from the Gallic residence. Some of those items, such as the sock stuffed in Renee's mouth, appear to have come from the very bedroom Kevin shared with his sons. Kevin reacted strangely when hearing that Renee's body had been found and Margie was going to call the authorities. Finally, Kevin made numerous false statements regarding his whereabouts on the day Renee disappeared. His explanations regarding why he lied lack credibility. Kevin's guilt can be readily presumed from his repeated statements of dishonesty and the totality of significant circumstantial evidence introduced against him. The entirety of the trial evidence was strong and compelling regarding his guilt. The jury began deliberating on this matter on August 8, 1997. It did not reach a verdict for nearly two weeks. During this time, Juror misconduct and other issues arose. On August 15, 1997, the foreman alerted the court that juror number B62 had expressed details that were not trial related. According to the foreman, juror number B62 had stated that one of his family members had purchased drugs from Kevin and that Kevin had molested that family member. Juror number B62 also told the foreman that from day one, his mind had been made up. The foreman identified three other jurors who had been told the same story. The court interviewed each of the jurors. Two jurors, numbers C54 and A35, separately informed the court that juror number B62 had commented to them about his niece or some other relative who had purchased drugs from Kevin or used drugs with him, and Kevin had possibly molested her. Juror number A35 had heard that kidnapping was involved. The third juror, number A22, indicated she had not heard juror B62 refer to improper material that was not in evidence. She had nothing to say about any possible juror misconduct. The court questioned juror number B62, who stated he had received information from his ex-wife that a member of his family had contact with Kevin. He acknowledged that he shared this rumor with other jurors. As a result, the court removed juror number B62 from the jury panel for misconduct. The remaining 11 jurors were brought into the courtroom and told that one juror had been excused for misconduct. 
Each juror was asked if they had heard any information, directly or indirectly, that former juror number B62 had relayed. Four jurors, including those the court had already interviewed, indicated they had heard such rumors. They all indicated that they could disregard them. The remaining jurors stated that they had not heard such rumors, and an alternate juror was impaneled, and the jury was excused. About seven days into deliberations, the prosecutors received an anonymous phone call stating one juror had been discussing the case with that juror's sister. The prosecution directed an investigator to interview the sister without alerting the trial court. The prosecution determined that there was no misconduct that had occurred. When the court became aware of this incident, it asked the prosecution to refrain from further independent investigations into possible juror misconduct without notifying the court and defense counsel. The juror in question was called into court, and she was asked to discuss the incident. The juror was upset by the investigation, but assured the court that it would not impact her continued participation on the jury in any way. Kevin did not object to this juror's continued participation on the jury and did not complain of prosecutorial misconduct. After 12 days of deliberation, the jury convicted Kevin Dwayne Gallick Sr. of murder and found a true special circumstance allegation that the murder was committed during the commission of, or attempted commission of, the crime of lewd acts on a child under the age of 14. Because the jury found the special circumstances allegation, Kevin faced the death penalty. Following a penalty phase, the jury agreed on life without parole, which the trial court imposed. And this, my friends, is where we're going to leave off with Renee's case. Be sure to come back next week for part two, where we cover a whirlwind of twists and turns that take part in the case. As if things could not get any worse for what this family has been through. I promise you it does. From incompetence to scandals, we'll be going on a deep dive. Be sure to follow on Instagram at Crime Connoisseurs. Have a case that you'd like to hear covered? Click the link in the bio and fill out the case suggestion form. In the meantime, keep it classy, connoisseurs. And I'll catch you next week for part two. Are you tired of settling for subpar cat food? It's time to upgrade your cat's dining experience with Smalls, the ultimate gourmet meal for your feline companion. Say goodbye to generic one-size-fits-all cat food. With Smalls, you can rest assured that your furry friend is getting the nutrition they deserve. Join the thousands of cat owners who have made the switch to Smalls and see the difference it can make in your cat's health and happiness. Treat your cat to the finest dining experience with Smalls. Visit smalls.sjv.io backslash ccpod now to order your first box. That's smalls.sjv.io backslash ccpod. Choose Smalls because your cat deserves the best.